Jujutsu Kaisen is very quickly becoming one of the most popular, well-regarded, and iconic manga in recent history. And while I myself have a love-hate relationship with the story, I do thoroughly enjoy what this manga and anime has to offer. Unfortunately for all JJK fans, Gege seems pretty determined to end this series in the near future, which means I, along with millions of other people that love the series, will have to find some new manga to migrate to. And thus, this video was born. Today, I'll be going over 19 series that for one reason or another, I think a majority of Jujutsu Kaisen fans would enjoy. Whether it be for the action, the art, the discussions, the characters or themes, there's a manga in this video that I'm sure will scratch that JJK itch for you. Starting things off with Kagurabachi might seem a little wild, considering how much of its publicity stemmed from a pretty dumb meme about it, but despite how new this manga is, the characters and story are already shaping up in a very positive way, a way that honestly leads me to believe that Kagurabachi might be one of the new big manga in the future. If the communal aspect of reading manga on a weekly basis is what really entices you about Jujutsu Kaisen, along with great writing of course, then Kagurabachi is certainly a manga that I would recommend. I would say that this manga and the community is in a really good spot right now, as even for how insular it is, I would say it's honestly pretty wholesome and a really good place to be in at the current point in time. Discussing chapters on a weekly basis in regards to Kagurabashi has been fun for me, and I will say that if that aspect really applies to you along with great action, great characters, great fights, it's something that you'll enjoy. Now, the story of Kagurabachi is pretty simple in its premise, focusing on Chihiro Rokuhira, the son of a famous swordsmith hell-bent on retrieving his father's six enchanted blades. Contrary to many of the other series I'll be mentioning today, if you're tapped into the manga community online, I'm sure you've heard of or seen a meme concerning this manga. And while a pretty decent portion of its initial attention came from what I would consider pretty dumb jokes, in just a few months since its debut, this story has really cemented itself as foundationally solid. At the time of recording this video, the manga is a bit over 30 chapters, but in that time span, a lot of Takeru Hokazono's writing chops have been put on display. Jiro serves as a solid protagonist on multiple fronts, even this early in his journey, being decently charismatic and quite unique in his personality relative to many other protagonists you'll find in Battle Shonen right now. What on the surface just seems like an edgy protagonist obsessed with revenge very quickly becomes a multifaceted character chock full of flaws, upsides, and doubts. He's definitely not the most expressive guy when it comes to his dialogue or facial expressions, at least in the beginning of the story, but he is quite earnest in his actions and compassion for those around him, and this authenticity contributes to him being quite likable from the jump. Kagurabachi also introduces an extremely engaging antagonist in Genichi Sojo right off the bat, and to this day, I think so Sojo and Shiro's dynamic is one of, if not my favorite things to come from this series. For this to be Hokazono's first serialized manga is extremely impressive, as he obviously has a good grasp on how to ramp up tension for the characters in the story, and ramp up tension for the audience as they are viewing it. The side cast is also pretty good as of right now, with Char, Shiba, Kunashige, Hiyuki, and Hakuri being the most intriguing ones thus far. The plot is simple enough to follow without too much effort, but it's still quite interesting to see unfold on a weekly basis, striking that perfect balance for a manga this early into its run. The presentation of Kagurabachi is also just absolutely stunning, as Okazono is able to nail the atmosphere and intensity he's aiming for in all of his fights and action set pieces. I honestly don't even think I'd be able to blame anyone for picking up Kagurabachi for its artistic merit alone. If Okazono is this good this early, I'm really excited to see how his style develops and flourishes as he continues publishing chapters. If you're worried about this manga getting the axe, not to test fate, but you honestly really shouldn't. While I can't guarantee anything for sure, the overwhelming support Kagurabachi has been getting both online and in its sales supports the idea of this series being here for the long haul. So if you want to hop in a manga that's likely to have a nice day in the magazine, Kagurabachi is the series for you. Following the trend of ongoing series for a bit, Undead Unluck is another manga running in Weekly Shonen Jump that I think many JJK fans would find utterly refreshing. If you like a complex power system with weird abilities, downtime between arcs that allows the characters to breathe and interact, emotionally climactic battles, and badass characters to root for, Undead Unluck is the story for you. In fact, despite me not liking it more than Jujutsu Kaisen as a whole, in some areas I think this manga is even better. If you're someone who thinks that Gege keeps his foot on the gas a little too much in terms of pacing, I honestly think that Undead Unluck takes a slower approach with its pacing and character interactions that you might enjoy. Unlike Kagurabachi, this series already has an anime adaptation that you can check out if you're interested, but I honestly don't see as many people talking about it as I'd expect relative to its pretty high production quality and story quality. Even as someone who isn't caught up 
to Undead Unluck on a weekly basis, I understand that this is a series worth its salt. It's somewhat hard to summarize the story because the plot veers really hard really early on, but the initial premise follows Undead Andy trying to finally escape his immortality and die at the hands of Fuko, who has very, 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 very bad luck to say the least and passes this horrible fate onto anyone she touches. Andy is the undead portion of the series name, with Fuku bringing the latter half to the table. The negator's power system is honestly really creative and cool, so if you're someone who enjoys JJK for its cerebral fighting style, I can confidently say that Undead Unluck will pleasantly surprise you. The only major downside that's worth noting when it comes to this story, at least as far as I'm concerned, is that the first few chapters have this running pervert gag with Andy and Fuku, and it's weird and kind of annoying early on. But if you can just power through it for a little bit, you'll reach a point where it just stops happening altogether. My personal guess is that the author felt pressured to add in this gag in order to keep viewer attention, but as soon as they realized that it wasn't necessary worsening their story and they were most likely going to continue their stay in the magazine, it dips and just disappears pretty quickly. Well, certainly notable for a little bit, the author does pretty quickly realize that it's not adding to the story and drops it. So if you prepare for that minor annoyance that won't last for very long, I think anyone that likes Jujutsu Kaisen for the aforementioned reasons will be able to carve out a spot for themselves in the Undead Unluck community. Ranger Reject is a fun story I'd recommend, solely because the premise is pretty unique relative to most battle shonen that I've consumed. Now I know that Go Go Loser Ranger is technically what the name officially translates to, but I'm gonna be totally honest with y'all, I'm not calling it that. It's not technically an inaccurate description of the core story, but Ranger Reject is much cooler to me, so for all the fans out there that are gonna be correcting me, just make that conversion in your head. Now, the most universal description I could give for this manga is like, imagine a Power Rangers show where the Rangers were corrupt and cynical, and the story was about one of the Radom fodder trying to overcome the entire world. The main character of the story is literally known as Foot Soldier D, and if that doesn't tell you that an interesting manga sits before you, I don't know what will. Ranger Redirect is one of those series that hinges quite a bit on the plot unfurling in interesting and engaging ways, chapter after chapter after chapter. The protagonist is definitely my favorite character relative to where I'm at in the story right now, but it's the world building and plot that has hooked me more than anything else. Out of all of the ongoing manga I mention in this segment, Ranger Reject is probably the most attached from what JJK is, but providing a story that somewhat opposes many of the approaches that Gege takes with his writing style seems like something I should at least add once on this list. If you're a JJK fan looking for a nice change of pace, but a really solid manga, I'd say Ranger Reject is a good place to start. The art is really good, the characters are really solid, and the plot is fun enough to keep you captivated more often than not. Shangri-La Frontier, much like Undead Unluck, is a story that hasn't started making the waves in the community that I expected, despite its pretty good anime adaptation. Much like Ranger Reject and Undead Unluck, I'm not caught up with the current events of the manga, solely because the binging experience for the story is my preferred method of engaging with this series. Despite that preference though, and revisiting the story a little bit ago for the sake of this video, I found it to be a series that I might as well put on y'all's radar. Shangri-La Frontier is a fun story to engage with and isn't super complicated to explain why. The story is primarily told from the perspective of Rokuro and his adventures in a game aptly called Shangri-La Frontier. Now, I know that isekai as a genre immediately puts some people off, and honestly, I'm somewhat the same but this series generally avoids many of the annoying tropes that you'd expect from your typical otherworldly story. I won't call this manga complex or particularly nuanced, but it more than makes up for this with its solid presentation, fun characters, and smooth plot progression. Minor plot twists and turns can be expected, but Rakuro is playing a video game at the end of the day, so many ideas and quest lines that you've likely encountered before will be present in the story in some form or fashion. If you're ever free and bored one day, Shangri-La Frontier is the kind of story you can kick your feet up and binge without worrying about having to lock in for. You certainly can get more from it than I have in my own experience if you do, but this manga has definitely existed for me as a nice series to unwind with more than anything, and I think it could be that for you too. In this video, there are going to be a handful of manga I really enjoy and want to make sure people check out. And Sakamoto Days is one of those manga. Now, I've actually talked about Sakamoto Days at length multiple times on the channel, and for good reason too, because this manga is just really, really fun, very, very often. Taro Sakamoto was the protagonist of Sakamoto Days, and as a retired assassin, bro gets into a lot of fights, and luckily for us, they're depicted masterfully. Sakamoto Days is just an action movie turned into sequential art, and I'm not gonna lie, if that description didn't move you at all, I'm gonna have to give you a prescription for 500 milligrams of fun because you're clearly not getting enough of that in your daily diet. From an action perspective, there are not many manga you can find on its level. If you want creative fights, you got it. If you want well choreographed fights, 
you got it. If you want impactful fights, you got it. And if all that wasn't good enough, the story and characters are actually really solid. I wouldn't say it's Sakamoto Day's strongest point, but I would say that it's good enough to keep me invested and interested. Much like Undead Unluck, I think Sakamoto Day somewhat caters to the kind of fan who wants the sidecast to get more attention. The manga has many arcs sprinkled all throughout that allow the characters within the universe and readers to catch their breath, comprehend and unpack everything demonstrated in the arcs prior, and successfully build up to the next big thread or story beat that we need to follow. Sakamoto Day's, in all honesty, is relatively simple. But due to that simplicity, it's able to really achieve what it sets out to do with so much efficiency that I would actually place it in the upper echelon of the weekly Shonen Jump magazine as a whole. Now with these next few stories that I'm going to recommend, I'd like to take a step back into the time machine and turn back the pendulum a little bit. The first few series that I recommended were what I would argue are JJK's contemporaries. Manga that are really good and can serve to be talked about more while also being pretty early into their respective stories or at least currently releasing chapters. The next three series I'll be talking about are the exact opposite. Classics that as a Jujutsu Kaisen fan, you should especially be interested in because of their connection to an influence on the series you like so much, starting with Taite Kubo's Bleach. Now I'm sure many of the people watching this video have seen Bleach already, but with Jujutsu Kaisen ushering in an entirely new age of Battle Shonen fans, I'd be remiss to not mention the black sheep of the big three at least once. You'd be surprised, but I personally know a few avid Jujutsu Kaisen fans who've never even cracked open a chapter of the story, despite it having a lot of the energy and vibes that make Jujutsu Kaisen so enjoyable for them, and it fundamentally coloring Gege's perspective on storytelling. It's clear that Kubo's work had an impact on Jujutsu Kaisen in an overall sense, with many references or homages existing in every aspect of the story, but I would say some characters even seem to overlap in the questions they ask the viewer or the premise of their very core. Yuji and Ichigo, as well as Aizen and Gojo's specifically stand out as characters that can be compared, and you quickly notice just how similar their overall structure and foundations are. If you are someone who's a bit newer to the game and haven't gotten into Bleach quite yet, or even just as a long-standing anime fan who's into JJK and hasn't quite made time for the story just yet, you can consider this a sign to at least put it more seriously on your list. Despite the many similarities and thematic overlapping, Kubo and Gege couldn't be different writers at their core, which leads to an interesting harmony of familiarity and unfamiliar ideas for you to compare and contrast. The first, but far from the last clumping up series that you will see on this video starts with Tagashi's two master classes of writing, Yu Yu Hakusho and Hunter Hunter. The obvious reason for the pairing here stems from both manga I'd like to recommend coming from the same author, but the influence that these two series have on Gege is actually kind of staggering. Don't get me wrong, Kubo has had a massive impact on Gege as a writer and many of the choices he's made throughout the story, but when it comes to references, callbacks, or straight up taking and repurposing concepts for his own manga, Gege might as well see Tagashi as the second coming of Christ. Cursed Energy's more logistical and scientific approach is clearly inspired by the likes of Nen. Binding Vows are just Nen contracts with a new coat of paint, Sukuna's finger gun dismantle is an obvious reference to Yusuke's spirit gun, and even domain expansions, an aspect of the power system that arguably helps separate Jujutsu Kaisen from the rest of the pack, is mere a combination of two concepts and fights taken from Tagashi. It's not a bad thing. In fact, it's pretty clear that JJK wouldn't be what it is without Tagashi as a source of inspiration. But because of this, I think reading Yu Yu Hakusho and Hunter Hunter is almost required reading for anyone who likes Gege's approach to storytelling. Hunter Hunter specifically is a bit more clinical and precise in its explanation of powers, but if you're looking for super cerebral interactions in combat, this manga will certainly deliver. Some would even argue that Hunter Hunter does this aspect of fight depictions better than Jujutsu Kaisen. The antagonists in both Yu Yu Hakusho and Hunter Hunter are also absolutely stellar and really stand out in a way that makes you understand why Gigi was so pressed to recreate them in some form or fashion. Conversely, Yu Yu Hakusho is less specific in the way powers are demonstrated and goes much more off of a personal growth and development leading to strength kind of writing style. The characters are extremely compelling, they work excellently as a group, and it's honestly home to one of the best tournament arcs in manga. If there's truly anything you like about Jujutsu Kaisen outside of series specific characters, it's likely that Tagashi has some of it in one of these manga. So I definitely recommend giving both of these series a try when you get the chance. Angst. Evangelion is just the angst that you can find in JJK cranked up infinitely. So if you enjoy that, you're likely to find Ava 
relatively good. I would say enjoyable or fun, but for me at least, neither of these things really held to be true. I think Ava is an excellent series, don't get me wrong, and it certainly had an impact on my life and approach to consuming stories moving forward, but I didn't necessarily like my experience with this anime, and in fact, I actually hated it explicitly very early on. Depending on the kind of person you are, Evangelion will do a good job of getting under your skin and making you feel uncomfortable. I happen to be an adolescent around Shinji's age when I watched Evangelion for the first time, and the self-doubt and lack of personal worth that I saw within his character reflected back on me in a way that was pretty deeply upsetting. Now, I like to think I'm mature enough to understand that's simply a mark of an amazing storytelling and characterization run, but in the moment, I couldn't acknowledge that. Despite all of this, it's a story that is really good at what it does, and for all of its angst and edge, it isn't a manga with a hopeless outlook. I would in fact say that Ava is a very hopeful series, specifically with how its conclusion is handled. In terms of influence, Gege mentions his religious reference is being inspired by Ava, and it's obvious that Yuta in his struggle throughout Volume Zero is at least partially inspired by Shinji. Also, big giant mecha stuff. I genuinely recommend Evangelion for all those willing to sit through a slower paced, very symbolic, and sometimes uncomfortable narrative that does all of these things for a specific reason. Once again, it's time to switch things up tonally as I talk about Ragna Crimson. You know what I mentioned with Sakamoto Days? I really like some of the manga I put on this list. Well, Ragna Crimson is one of those series. The prior two segments focus mainly on ongoing manga and stories that inspire Jujutsu Kaisen, but the next five series I'll be recommending, including this one, will primarily be about hands. If you like Jujutsu Kaisen because of how much people fight and the quality of those clashes, you're gonna want to lock into these next five mangas, starting with Ragna Crimson, which is one of my favorite series relative to its overall popularity. The story of Ragna Crimson is one about revenge and protection, as Ragna is given the power over his future self in order to slay every dragon that exists in his world and prevent the people that he knew and loved from dying, while simultaneously avenging them for all of the suffering caused by those very dragons in the future. The premise this may sound slightly convoluted due to all the time traveling shenanigans, but I promise in practice it's extremely simple. Ragna is granted an extraordinary amount of power that allows him to slay and overwhelm dragons physically, with Crimson being the brains behind the operation and assisting in keeping Ragna from killing himself with his own eagerness. The art in Ragna Crimson is really good and totally fits the high fantasy setting of the story. Harsh shading to really amplify character emotions and reactions paired with a ridiculous scope and scale for the battles leads to easy each and every main fight in this story absolutely flooring you. Ragna is by far the best character in the story, but the author does a good enough job in fleshing out the side cast and antagonist so that you are able to get invested in the events of the manga, and it very often justifies Ragna's rage in relation to the dragons. Multiple cool double page spreads from Ragna's fight stand out, and while I wouldn't say these action sequences nail choreography in the same way series like Jujutsu Kaisen and Sakamoto days do, it makes up for this by making each big attack absurdly cool to look at and see in action. Following Ragna Crimson's act, we have what might just be the most unconventional manga that I recommend in this video, Baki. Because while this series at its core is just a story of Baki training to finally defeat his father and gain the love of his mother, it spirals into something so different and uh, unique to use a word. The plot of Baki isn't something that I think will interest a future Baki fan, rather it's the exploration and execution of the characters, the fights, and the distinct aura that emanates off this manga that has attracted the cult-like following that it has. The very way that the world is drawn exists in this strangely uncanny realm between hyper-realistic depictions of the human body and exaggerated proportions that can only be found in the wackiest of series. Fights in Baki are often a confrontation of ideals and personalities shrouded in muscles and martial arts, and the writing style and explanation for situations in this manga touch on a level of absurdity that I don't think I've quite seen in the medium. To like Baki, you must be okay with three things. An elusive and winding storyline that doesn't progress in a linear or even sensical fashion all the time, a sense of humor to enjoy Itagaki's writing style, and the genuinely unhinged events that happen in this manga, and the ability to totally believe in what these characters say as fact itself. When the narrator says that a character has achieved nirvana, through losing their left pinky toe on a Sunday, your immediate reaction must be a nod and a page flip. If you can do all of that, or all of these things I mentioned even seem enticing to you, read Baki. I'm sure you'll get the same kick out of it that I did. Start with Baki the Grappler, then move to Baki 1999, Baki Hanma, Baki Do 2014, Baki Do 2018, and finally Baki Rahen. If that seems confusing, <laughs> then uh, good luck with Baki. I look forward to the liquefaction of your brain cells. 
Tenkaichi Nihon Saikyo Bugeshi Kete Sen is a manga with a really long name. Did I have to say that entire thing? No. Did it take me an uncomfortably long time to get that pronunciation correct? Perhaps. Why did I do it then? The world may never know. But what you and I can both know for certain is that this manga knows how to depict a good action sequence. Even more so than many of the other manga in this meathead category, Tenkaichi is truly a series that only exists to facilitate fights. It's a tournament manga set in the Sengoku era with the purpose of determining who the next Lord of Japan will be. This plot kind of gets extrapolated on in here and there, but I'm going to be honest, the story has nothing to do with why I find this manga so enjoyable and why I think anybody that reads this will want to. As I'm sure you're seeing right now, the art in this manga is absolutely incredible, mastering both the intricate choreography you could find in a series like Sakamoto Days and big splash pages that encompass massive moves like you can find in Ragna Crimson. The art style isn't anything quite like what I've discussed before in this video, but style, it certainly has. If I had to compare it to something, I'd say it's like Ragna Crimson with worse characters, but cooler spectacles. Unlike Baki and Ragna Crimson, no one really stands out in this cast as being a particularly good character right now, with most of them being pretty one-dimensional action figures. But I don't say this as an insult to the story or the manga, because it's pretty clear that development and nuance isn't the point of this story, at least not right now. If you want to see cool fights occur between characters with unique movesets and fighting styles, check this manga out. If you want boring stuff for nerds like character or nuance or development or themes then i don't know go read shakespeare or something fight class 3 wears everything on its sleeve from the title the main character enrolls himself in a fight class to get revenge on their father and find his long lost sister a pretty big focus on martial arts and detailed choreography exists in this manga and it is a somewhat different style from the other series mentioned in this section of the video actually hold on i'm checking my notes and they say that this is not a manga at all, and it's actually a Korean webtoon. Kind of breaks the whole manga aspect of this video, but webtoon or not, this shit is hard. The harsh shading is somewhat reminiscent of Ragna Crimson at times, and I think it leads to some really dynamic, expressive, and pretty intense panels, but it's mixed with a more down-to-earth scale that'll be fun for anybody interested in a combat sports manga of this variety. The story does take a pretty dramatic tone shift partway through, but I don't want to spoil the surprise for you if you do decide to check it out. Just like Tenkaichi, it's just about the hands. Go into it expecting that and nothing more. Contrasting that a bit, we have Kengen Ashura, which amongst the meathead manga that I'm going to mention in this video, is the story that I think is the most well-rounded most conventional and maybe most overall good with Baki or Ragna Crimson potentially competing with this series in that aspect. But I genuinely consider Baki something separate altogether. Like that's barely a story and more of just an amalgamation of words and art that turns into an experience. And Ragna Crimson shines through with its protagonists more than its memorable or well-developed supporting cast. Much like Tenkaichi though, the story primarily exists within a tournament manga setting with Tokita Oma being the protagonist. Now, the tournament setting leads to many consecutive interesting battles with good art, good choreography, and good power set ideas. The reason I hone on the story's well-roundedness the most is because I think it's Kang and Ashura's most valuable asset, and it's something that sets it apart from every other story in the dumb dumb fight fight category. Very rarely do I feel a tournament manga like this nails the fights and has an entertaining plotline with developing and interesting character arcs. You're not gonna get an Urasawa level storyline out of this, but what you can get is pretty good character development and at least a plot that is relatively coherent all the way through. Oma and Kazuo's relationship grows into a pretty touching father-son like dynamic and the end of this manga will hit you like a freight train. Another bonus, if you happen to really enjoy this series, it has a sequel manga called Kangen Omega and it's pretty damn entertaining too. I know this section focused primarily on the meathead aspects of manga that JJK fans will like, but if you want to mix up story and character with your super fun fights, then Kangen Asura will be the way you want to go. The next two manga on this list are series that I find have a pretty large overlap with Jujutsu Kaisen fans, with my guess being that it's the messy and scratchy aesthetic these manga have combined with their more explicit fight scenes that attract a similar demographic of people that are likely to enjoy it. Chainsaw Man is the first of these two manga, and chances are you've at least heard of this series if you're watching the video. To say something that hasn't already been talked about with Chainsaw Man would be a Herculean task, so I'll just lean into its strengths. Part 1 especially has a really, really strong aesthetic to it that can't be mistaken for any 
any other story or any other manga that is not written and illustrated by Tatsuki Fujimoto. Well, it had the messy and somewhat unrefined look that can be classified similarly to Jujutsu Kaisen's, Fujimoto's obsession with cinema and his own unique take on that had a noteworthy impact on every facet of Chainsaw Man's presentation. From the character tropes to the paneling, a large majority of Fujimoto's somewhat eccentric delivery can be chalked up to his obsession with film and his predisposition to being slightly unhinged. The pacing of the story is quick, even quicker than Jujutsu Kaisen's in the first part, with the second part of the story really hitting the brakes and giving the audience more time to sit with the mundane experiences that exist in everyday life. Denji, Aki, Power, Makima, and eventually Asa all stand out as some of the series' best characters, so if you haven't given this manga a chance, and a series illustrated by a film buff sounds interesting to you, this might be the sign you were looking for to finally crack open Chainsaw Man. Much like with Chainsaw Man, I find that many of the Hell's Paradise fans that I know are fans of JJK as well and vice versa, with the largest difference in reception amongst these three manga simply being the popularity of the works. JJK is by far the most popular, followed in a distant second by Chainsaw Man, with Hell's Paradise being an even more distant third, and that's just a shame. I'm not even necessarily saying that this manga deserves either of those series success more than they do, but Yuji Kaku was definitely in his element when he wrote and illustrated this manga, and I do wish that he was able to get more recognition for this. The series follows Gabimaru the Hollow and his expedition to an island rumored to have the elixir of life. Sentenced to death with no other way than the retrieval of this elixir to be pardoned from his crimes, Gabi Maru and many other criminals and executioners journey to this island and find much more than they bargained for. This story is only 127 chapters long, but it's enthralling from start to finish, and I would argue that it has the benefit of being completely bingeable in a way that many of the manga I mentioned and will mention are not. Gabi Maru is an amazing protagonist, and over the course of the story, we see him come to grips with his own humanity, weakness, and desires for love as the hollowness with in him starts to wither away. Grappling with weakness and how accepting that vulnerability is its own kind of strength is a core theme within this manga, and just about every character in this story embodies it during the course of their own character arcs. Gabimaru and Sigiri Simon stand head and shoulders above the rest of the cast in terms of complexity and writing quality, but because Yuji Kaku keeps the cast rather small compared to Jujutsu Kaisen and Chainsaw Man, he's able to explore and elaborate on the cast's backstories and display their development much better than the aforementioned manga. Pound for pound, I think it's it's more than fair to say that Hell's Paradise has the best supporting cast of these three series, with Gabimaru being as competently written and personally enjoyable to me as Yuji and Denji. I would say it's nothing short of a tragedy that the anime adaptation for the story didn't drum up as much hype as it deserved, and I hope that maybe with this video and recommendation, at least a few more people are able to get into this really great story. Alongside the easily followable plot and well-written characters, Hell's Paradise is also home to its own messy yet discernible art style. The atmosphere of the island is consistently eerie, and the simultaneous man-made feel of the environment and entirely natural surroundings just creates a dissonance that can be felt by the characters and audience alike. I made a video going into the core themes of strength and weakness in its own video if you are more interested in a deep dive of the series, but even if not, I recommend checking out this manga if you haven't already. It's complete in nature, means you can collect all of the beautiful volumes physically if you want and not have to worry about slogging through a weekly experience. One of my favorite manga that I recommended in this video today, by far. Speaking of favorites, it's time to switch gears for the final stretch of the video. The final three manga I will be advocating for or personal suggestions somewhat separated from the relation or comparison to Jujutsu Kaisen as a whole. Maybe you think that defeats the point of this video, but uh, Hajime no Ippo is a boxing manga. Hajime no Ippo also happens to be one of the greatest stories I've ever read in my life. With a story centered around Ippo and his pursuit for the meaning of strength, and a chapter length that makes One Piece seem like a bedtime story, you're probably wondering how a series as simple in concept as this can spiral into something so expansive. The simple answer for that is that George Morikawa is a visionary who understands how to play the long game like nobody's business. Hajime no Ippo doesn't have bloat, it doesn't have pointless hearts, and I'd argue that it barely has pointless chapters, if any at all. Everything in this story exists to either build up a new conflict or pay off an old one, and as time progresses, Morikawa's pen and authorship just ages like fine wine. Hajime no Ippo has some of the best fights in manga, multiple of the best rivalries in manga, one of the best protagonists in manga, and continues to deliver chapter after chapter after chapter. Go read Hajime no Ippo. I promise you, it's good for your soul. 
Call of the Night is a manga about an insomniac who meets a vampire. Ko, the protagonist and insomniac in question, meets Nazana, the ambiguously aged vampiric slacker who, for the first portion of the series, acts as a guide for Ko to work through some of his own issues, re-establish a desire for connection with other people, and well, explain the Call of the Night that rings so loudly for Ko in the hours of darkness. Notice how I said in the first portion of the story, because while Call of the Night remains rooted in its slice of life and romance elements, at a certain point, things start heating up and we get to see some cool vampiric battles that are much more exciting than you'd expect from a manga that started in this fashion. Ko is a pretty charming protagonist with a calm demeanor accompanied by a sharp tongue and he's complimented nicely by Nazuna's more outgoing personality, vulgar joking style, and aloof nature. As the call of the night grows louder and louder for Ko, the world of darkness becomes full with many more characters and fuller storylines that are genuinely gripping. I don't want to spoil any of the surprises of the series, but when I first checked out this manga, I certainly didn't expect much of what I eventually got, and that turned out for the best. What I think ties everything together for this series is its beautiful art style that truly encapsulates the breathtaking nature of the night, and it gives us a good reason to be so interested in this time in the same way that Ko is. The story is complete, sitting at a round 200 chapters, so if you're looking to binge a unique manga from start to finish, Call of the Night might be what you want to check out next. Blue Lock, Blue Lock, Blue Lock. Dread it, run from it, Blue Lock arrives all the same. And now, it's here. Blue Lock is a story I've talked about many times on the channel and a series I will defend and praise till my last breath. Blue Lock is a sports manga, specifically one centering around 300 strikers being put through the ringer in the Blue Lock facility with the hopes of becoming the best striker in the world. Simple and straight to the point, but also slightly insane relative to many other sports manga premises just the way I like it. Now I've talked about this series extremely in depth numerous times and will continue to do so. So you can check out any of those videos if you want a more nuanced and detailed review. But Blue Luck basically has everything that you could ask for from an entertainment perspective. You want thrilling action with intense stakes? Blue Luck's got you. You want some of the best art and ongoing manga can have? Blue Luck's got you. You want well-developed characters and interesting dynamics between those characters? Blue Luck's got you. Hell, even if you want a story that exists beyond simple entertainment and has a very poignant message, I made a whole video on this manga's ability to inspire people because Blue Luck's got you. If you want it, Blue Luck's got it. And if I wasn't clear for my sales pitch so far, I'm a really big fan of the story with about seven or eight rereads under my belt, and it's one of the few manga I've ever recommended to people that I've personally seen zero hating reviews from. Everybody I recommend Blue Luck to enjoys Blue Luck, and if you're watching this video, you gotten this far, you made it to the last recommendation, that means there's a mental connection here, that means you're locked in and I know that Blue Luck's good for you. Check it out. Everybody I know that reads Blue Luck likes Blue Luck, so if you'd like to become one of those people, pick up the manga and become an egoist. <sighs> And that is a collection of 19 manga for Jujutsu Kaisen fans. If any particular story or group of stories stood out to you amongst those that you plan on checking out, let me know down in the comment section below. I look forward to each and every one of these manga getting a new fan, and I wish you well on your future binging endeavors. I hope you enjoyed the video, and as always, I'll see you in the next one.